Hi everyone, I am uh, here today with a good old friend Yukai Chow, uh, who's a pioneer and international keynote speaker on gamification. And he's been a you know, regular speaker and lecturer on gamification worldwide, uh, Stanford University, Accenture, TEDx, South by Southwest, and a lot more. Um, and uh, you know, it's just fun to have you to have you here, Yukai. How's it going? Great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so let's just let's jump right um, jump right into it. Uh, gamification. You know, you you gave a TED a TEDx talk recently uh, about gamification, and and you kind of started this talk uh, talking about the power of play and harnessing mm -hmm. the power of play. And maybe you can tell people what you mean by that and what you mean by gamification. Okay. So, you know, we actually spend a lot of time playing games. We as a species, right? And it doesn't have to be computer games or video games, just, just playing. And when we, when we play, when we spend time on it, there's actually a lot of labor going into the system, right? You're doing, you're, you're doing a lot of things. You're building a character. You're, you're solving problems. You're leveling up. You're doing repetitive things to see more progress. And so, and so that is the power of play where you're doing something. However, the problem with games is that that something only gets stored in a, in a fantasy escapism world, in the world of games, or just lost period, or it gets reset. So, the key with gamification and the promise of it is that, hey, imagine all the hours we spent on games were actually making the world a better place, making our lives better. Like if there was a, if there was a game where every single hour you spend on it, your life becomes better and you're more productive, you make more money, you're learning new languages, you're playing a new instrument and all that stuff, that would be extremely, extremely powerful. So, so you know, and, and, and technically, you know, people say a full-time job is like 40 hours a week, which we both know that's not really a full-time <laughs> job, right? You have, a, right? you have 168 hours a week. If you spend 40, 50 hours sleeping, let's say 40, you don't sleep much, and you do a 40-hour job, you still have 88 hours a week left, right, to do whatever you want. So a 40-hour job is not, is not full-time. It's, it's a quarter of your time. Right. You can do three more quarter job uh, full time <laughs> on that, yeah. and and so what happens is that you know people spend the other times you know doing things that that entertain them, that make them relax. You know, they people watch TV a lot, or they hang out with friends. They enjoy. You know, obviously they don't think so. A lot of times they're just not efficient, right? They're just like, oh, I'm just sitting here figuring out what to eat or whatnot. But we do spend a decent amount of time just figuring out how to relax, how to figure out how to do things that are interesting, enjoyable. And so I believe that if you spend all that time, you know, towards something that's productive, but just as engaged, just as fun, exciting, even in, even your full-time job is gamified, then you'll see a ton of productivity and excitement and joy and happiness in this world. And that's the vision that I talked about in, in gamification. Right. It's, it's this idea that, so there's, there's this um, elements or, or mechanics of games that if we just implemented them in other areas of our lives, they would make them more productive, more fun, more fulfilling, et cetera, right? Yeah. You, you know, it was, I, was, um, I remember we had a talk a couple of years ago, maybe, I don't know when it was, but you, you said that, and it just stuck in my head, that gamification is actually human-focused design. Do you mm -hmm. still do you still kind of believe that? Yeah. Do you still stand by that? Yeah. So, what, what would, why is that human focus? Why? Because okay. I, I I'm sure that most people that hear gamification in no way they think, oh, this is just thinking about how humans. Yeah, uh, and and, and this actually has been picked up more in the gamification community. So so again, I believe gamification is actually human focused design as opposed to function focused design. So most designs are function focused, which means they're optimized for output and efficiency, you know, and, and so it's kind of like a factory where you automatically assume that people in the factory will do their work and then kind of figure out how do I get the most value out of it? How do I create more the most production? Now, human focused design remembers that people in the system have feelings, have motivations, have insecurities, you know, reasons why they do or do not want to do something. And it optimizes for that. So this is kind of like a theme park where you design it to be really, really fun and then you can predict that people will automatically want to line up for hours and hours just so they can enjoy the experience. Now the reason why we call it human focused design is that the gaming industry is the first, or the one reason why we call it gamification actually is, the, is because the gaming industry is the first industry to master human focused design. Because there's no real purpose to play a game. You never have to play a game. Like You have to do your taxes, you have to go to school, you have to go to work. 
so, so they can suck, right? And you still have to do it. But games, you never have to play a game. So they're always trying to figure out how to make it more engaging, more interesting, so you want to play it, that you're always thinking about, that you want to, that you're almost addicted to playing it. And if, you, if, if this same game doesn't do a, as good of a job, you're going to play another game. So because games have spent decades or even centuries, depending on how you qualify a game, to figure out how to engage people when, when, you know, that's, you know, when you don't have to play them, now we're learning from these games, and that's what we call the gamification. Well, it's, well, to me, it's fascinating because you touch on a thing that I, I feel very passionate about, which is this idea that we need to shatter and just forget about it. This idea that we're super rational, you know, efficiency machines, that we as humans know all the time what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if I didn't do something, it's because I'm stupid or lazy or whatever. And if I did do something, it's because I am... Uh, uh, you get you there? I got, yes. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I can shut up. Don't worry, I can edit this. Um, so I'll, I'll start off this idea again. Uh, this this makes me think of this um, idea that I think we need to forget about, which is that we are that humans are this sort of rational efficiency machines. Uh, when in reality we make a lot of mistakes, we forget things. If we don't do something, if something doesn't turn out the way we want it, it's not because we we're lazy or stupid. And if we accomplish something, it's not just because we're great and 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 perfect and super smart. Uh, I think this is a very uh, outdated way of thinking in a world that's full of stimulus, that's full of, you know, things, you know, shouting at you all the time, it's really hard to be on top of everything. And I think we need better systems around us to help us live better. And I understand that gamification is this sort of, you know, overarching idea of how to implement those systems that are much better aligned with how humans actually work. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a... Um, uh, an author I, I talk about a lot, uh, Alain de Botton, and he has a, a book recently about art. Uh, he, the book is called Art as Therapy, and how he says art was, you know, can play a much bigger role in how in, in reminding us how to live better than just being this cute thing that we have on the walls. Uh, and and but to, for us to do that, to accept that, then we need to basically embrace the idea that we do need some help, that we that we we're not in full control all the time. Uh, so, so in that in that case, and I've never thought of gamification. Honestly, this is fascinating to me. Never thought of games really being the first one to figure out. Well, you know, we need to really tap into how humans think if we want people to do this. Because yeah, it, there's, it, there's there's actually a a interesting uh, industry that you know because people talk about oh, this is very similar to user experience design, UX, UI. And there's also terms of the user-focused design, right? Mm -hmm. And I and people ask me, so what's the difference? And there, and from from what I see so far, there's a key difference. Most of the things on usability, UX, UI, a lot of it is focused on how to make it easier mm -hmm. for the human to do the task. It's easier, assuming they want to do it, right? It's like right. what's intuitive. They're like, okay, well, the person can figure out how to do this. They can do this, but it doesn't really focus on the motivation. It most UX user focused design that I've seen don't really think about what motivates them to do it. More about it more focuses on how to make it, you know, simpler for them. Right. And and so and so gamification slash human focused design really thinks about, okay, well, maybe they like it because there's a there's an element of unpredictability. Maybe they like it because it it's so exclusive. Maybe they like it because it, it ties them to a higher vision, a bigger meaning. Right. And I think if yeah. someone tells you, hey, I'm a usability expert or I'm a U UX designer, I don't think they usually think about things like that. Right. No, I, so I agree. And, and, uh, and you, got, you know, this is a good tie-in into what I think it's a, an incredible body of work that you've done, which is this uh, the Octolysis uh, framework. This is, uh, I always say that when people can kind of like create a model that, all, that, help us, that helps other people see better and, and you know make make better sense of their lives, that's genius work. And to me tell us this is genius genius work. So maybe you can talk a bit about the the eight you know core drives of octalysis and what you know how you got to that idea. Uh, and maybe you know talk a little bit about what, what, what each of these um, drives are about because then I want to see how we can how how could that be something that can people implement in their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah okay so octalysis is a design framework that I that I created and I, I created it because I was frustrated with all the misconceptions in the gamification community about just slapping on points, badges, and leaderboards into a design and think, oh, that's going to make things fun. 
And so, so the key premise is that, hey, look, most games out there have all these game elements in them, points, badge, leaderboards, but most games are not successful. Most games are still suck. So it's really naive to think that, hey, if I just take these elements that are found in games that, are, that even suck and put into my product, it'll be amazingly engaging, which, you know, obviously that doesn't make any sense. So I created a framework, Octalysis, and it's called Octalysis because it's an analysis based on an octagon shape, and it breaks down human motivation into eight core drives. And so I believe that every single thing you do outside of a dream, outside of a game or not, is based on one or more of these eight core drives. And that also means that if there's none of those eight core drives present, there's no motivation. Your user does not move forward because there's no reason to do it. And so these eight core drives, uh, quickly going over, there's the first one, which is epic meaning and calling, which means you're doing something bigger than yourself. And this is why... For instance, people contribute to you know, Wikipedia, not to make more money, not to build your resumes, but because you feel like you're protecting humanity's knowledge, something bigger than yourself. Then there's Core Drive 2, Development Accomplishment, which is the feeling of, hey, I'm leveling up, I'm achieving mastery, you know, I'm improving myself, and, and that's a very engaging process. So that is where most of the points you know, are in, you know, just, just showing your progress, right? Badges, showing you accomplishment so you feel motivated. So most of what's understood in gamification is, is stuck in Core Drive 2. And Core Drive 3 is empowerment of creativity and feedback, which is like Lego. You give users the basic building blocks, and there's an infinite amount of ways for them to use their creativity, you know, try different strategies and combos, see feedback, and adjust. And that's like, also, like maybe also programming kind of has this. Yeah, right? pro like programming yeah, program. has a lot of immediate feedback that you get when you try yes. new things. Yeah. Anything that requires some creativity, problem solving, and you can see how well you did and you can adjust, that's, that utilizes Core Drive 3. And that is just fun to begin with. Like it's engaging. It sucks people in. Um, then there's Core Drive 4, ownership and possession. Which is the concept of, oh, because you feel like you own something, you want to improve it, you want to protect it, and you want to get more of it. So, you know, this obviously ties into, you know, virtual goods, virtual currency, it deals with collection sets, collecting stamps. It's also the, the core drive that makes us want to accumulate wealth. Mm. You know, sometimes it's not like we need the money because we're starving. It's more like, ah, I'm watching something grow, <laughs> uh, right? Then there's core drive five, social influence and relatedness, which is all the things you do based on what other people do think or say. So that deals with things like envy, mentorship, you know, group quests, mm. treasure, social treasure. But it also has the relatedness piece, which is stuff like nostalgia. Like if you see a product that reminds you of your childhood, then you automatically have a higher chance of wanting to buy that product. Mm. If you meet someone from your same hometown, then you, you have a higher chance of striking a deal with them. So, so it's like, hey, I can relate to this person. Let, let me, let me uh, before we go, move on, because let me stop you on this one, because uh, I'm just right now, I'm writing this, uh, an essay on what I'm calling uh, locked-in beliefs. Uh, I'm, I'm taking this idea from John Lanier, uh, uh, who's the sort of you know, technologist uh, in the Silicon Valley area. But he talks about locked-in technology, which is, you know, how sometimes something, just because it kind of spread out too soon, uh, it just gets locked in, and we still use that even though it sucks, or even though there's something better, but, but it's so expensive for everybody to just change it. It's like, um, you know, we're, we're, we built on top of it, and at this point, we can't change that. Um, and I was thinking that some people have locked-in beliefs, which is, you know, what, you know, the idea that, you know, you need to go out of college to get a degree. Like, that's a belief that's so locked in in some people and it doesn't really matter if you give a rational explanation of why no you should maybe in your particular case you should be doing this other thing because it's locked in it's something that's in and and what i was thinking is that uh uh it really comes down to the social part the reason that locked in beliefs are so powerful uh because what mm -hmm. it what it does is that um you know you don't want when you do something that challenges other, that is basically an embodiment of a belief that's different from other people around you. You're basically telling them, "Well, I think you're wrong because my actions show that I believe I think I, I, you know, I live my life in a different way." So, is you know how do you, my, my my question I guess and what I'm trying to get at is if you have some if you find someone that has a belief that is motivated and acts accordingly, but motivated because of social influence and relatedness. Do you, but, it, but it's maybe a wrong action or it's something that it's not beneficial for them. 
do you go in some do you try to maximize the other drives do you how do you try to lower that that the intensity of, of that particular drive how, how do you how do you go about that this completely depends on your objective and actually what you say is, makes a lot of sense you know it, it's actually very interesting uh, i don't know if you you know about the book uh, thinking fast and slow from Kahneman yeah but yeah by daniel Kahneman yeah so he talks about the concept of hey if you are traveling, you're buying insurance, and let's say you know someone, you read someone who who died of a terrorist attack. It says, would you would you buy insurance in case of you die for any reason, or would you buy insurance um, that covers if you die from a terrorist attack? Now, most people would value the terrorist attack insurance more higher, mm. even though it's irrational because. Dying from anything obviously is more valuable than dying just specifically from a terrorist attack. But because they they're relating to that that terrorist attack, they're like, oh, my friend, you know, died from a terrorist attack. So I think I'm going to pay for the terrorist one, not for the, the total one, and it costs the same thing. So that's something that is is part of relatedness, but it's irrational, right? And so again, completely depends on your goal, right? And the, one of the big things of Octalis is it's not just about you know. Engage your motivations about gamification. So games are just fun. Gamification is utilizing fun and and motivation to to drive a purpose. And what that purpose determines what you do with it. So sometimes you want to bring out other core drives. Sometimes you want to correct that irrational behavior. Sometimes you're you're utilizing that irrational behavior to get people to exercise more. Or if you're you know you're unethical, then use that to make more money for yourself. And um, and and sometimes it's a, it's a balance between all of that. So so it just depends. But, right, but, right. No, but, but, but it makes a lot of sense that, that you know it's it's up to the goals how you do what you do. But I but I think it's it was very interesting. I never thought of that the idea of beliefs being what like that sometimes we believe what we believe and we are accordingly because of the 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 motivation that comes with the social influence of religion. But that was that that to me was very interesting. So but sorry, let's keep going with the the other ones. Uh, that I want to ask. That's interrupt. good. Yeah, but I want to just quickly add that again. The the nice thing about Octalis, is, especially level one that we're talking about now, is that it allows us to have a frame to understand and analyze that motivation, see what's strong, what's weak, what's what's out of place, and then eventually, you know, I go into I get into more about how do you design for a purpose, what are the business metrics, who are the users, what are the desired actions, you know, what are the win states, and then those start targeting that understanding of motivation towards a direction right. but at this point it's still just the motivational part so so then there's core drive six which is scarcity and impatience and this is the core drive that says you want something just because you can't have it like if grapes are on the table you just don't care about those grapes but if they're on a shelf just beyond your reach you're always thinking about them or they're you know just, are they sweet can i have them when can i have them and when someone walks by and touches those grapes you're like, oh are they going to serve us now and it's right. no it's just, it's just like dusting right so so this for their advantages. Uh, a lot of companies, they uh, what students can and you get, uh, you get, sorry, can you can you start uh, because I got cut off for a second? Can you start from a lot of companies again? Okay. Yeah, sorry. So a lot of companies utilize this to monetize better or increase their demand. So, like Facebook, at the beginning of Facebook, they, Facebook said we're only for Harvard students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we're maybe later on we're for like a few Ivy League schools and Stanford. And so, when it opened up to more schools, more schools wanted to join. Like more students wanted to join. And um, then, then there are games that say, hey, you know, um, you can play this game for an hour, but then you have to stop because your energy ran out, or you have to wait for your plants to harvest. You have to come back six hours from now. So people are like. Wait, I wanted to play a little bit more, and they're right. stuck. So they log in an hour later, four hours later, five hours later, even though their brain knows it hasn't been six hours yet. Right. But they obsess because they were cut off from playing, right. and, uh, and so that's the power of scarcity and patience. Now, core drive seven is unpredictability and curiosity, which is the core drive that says, you know, you want you, you because you don't know what's going to happen next. You're always thinking about it. So that deals with things like, oh, I want to finish a book or, or a, a movie. Obviously, it's heavily in, utilized in the gambling industry, right? right, right, right. Uh, it's like, oh, unpredictable results. And there's a lot of science to back that one up. Whenever you have a, 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 a sweepstakes or lottery program, it utilizes that core drive too. Right. So right. like the most famous uh, uh, study about that is called the Skinner Box. And so basically scientists put an animal in a box and, and there's a lever in the box. So the first experiment is that whenever the animal presses the lever, 
food comes out. And what you'll see is that the animal will press the lever until it's no longer hungry because it doesn't eat food anymore. Makes right. sense. But when you change the experiment to the point where whenever the animal presses the lever, food may or may not come out and sometimes to come out, what you'll see is that the animal constantly pressing the lever regardless if it's hungry or not because it's just messing with its brain. Like, will it come out? Will it come out? Will it come out? Right. right? And so, and so, and, and a lot of people actually make a big mistake. They think in terms of the Skinner box, a lot of people say, oh, you know, gamification, this points badge stuff is like putting people in the Skinner box. And that's actually a misunderstanding because right. we know that points and badges are really core drive too. The, the main thing Skinner Box proves is that when it's an unpredictable result, you know, it, it actually drives obsession from your brain. Mm. The last and final core drive, core drive eight, is loss and avoidance, which is straightforward. You're avoiding a loss. You don't want something bad to happen. And uh, therefore, you either do something or you do, don't do something. And so, and you know, there's a lot of interesting examples going to go into there, but most people understand, you know, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want bad things to happen. So the, the key, the interesting thing about octalysis is, again, it's, it's charted on an octagon shape. And, and I coined a few terms. I coined the, like white hat gamification and black hat gamification, as well as left brain and right brain gamification. And I don't know how much you want to go into that, but the, the, the quick summary is that the white hat gamification are things that make people feel powerful and great, and it creates long-term sustained uh, activities, but it doesn't really make, uh, it doesn't create urgency. Black hat gamification makes people feel obsessed, addicted, and mm. it creates a lot of urgency, but in the long run, it leaves a bad taste in their mouth. So sometimes they would want to leave the system when they can. Right, right brain core drives, which is the, the core drives on the right, um, they're more focused on intrinsic motivation versus the left brain, which is extrinsic. So ex extrinsic motivation are things that you do for a purpose, for a goal. Like let's say your job sucks. It's like digging done out of the ground, you know, yeah. it's a little crappy job and you hate it. It smells bad. But someone shows up and says, hey, for every gun you dig out, I'll give you $10,000. So you're like, oh, this is easy money. <laughs> yeah, and you're motivated. <laughs> Even though the, the task still sucks, it's not fun. Right. Because there's a reward, you're motivated. Now, interest things that you would actually pay money to do, you know, instead of get a reward for and uh, so you don't necessarily need a reward to enjoy using your creativity. You don't need a reward to hang out with your friends. And you don't need a reward to necessarily you know, be in the suspense of unpredictability. We just talked about casinos, right? In casino, right. you actually have a negative reward. Most right. people know statistically screwed by the casino. That's how they make so much money. But people will say like, hey, you know, I lost my $200, but it was so much fun, right? It was fun because throughout those, that day, you felt you could have won, and that's the fun right. part. And, right. you're, and you're paying for that feeling of, of could have won. Right, and the, the, so this is fascinating. You have this base, basically, not only you have the, the, the drives, but also you have the sort of, you know, uh, groups or, or areas where depending on what you want to do, you, you know, or you want people to do, um, you try to lean more towards one or the other. Uh, you know, it seems to me that it's really good to try to get people more in the white hat, uh, uh, section and also maybe more into the intrinsic section. I mean, I, I mean, you could argue that a lot. Or I guess what I guess what I'm trying to say is that for a lot of people, it seems that seems to be what's missing the most. Like most people kind of have enough of the extrinsic, um, not very fulfilling drives in their lives already. Uh, but what I think most people are looking for is how do I get more of the other? The, you know, the, the ones. Yeah. That so, so this this again depends on the goal. Because again, the problem with white hat is that it does not create urgency. So let's right. say I'm saying, hey, go out and change the world. And you're excited. Yeah, I'm going to go change the world. But I'm going to go brush my teeth first. I'm going to have a nice breakfast, right? No urgency. Right, right. But if I take out a gun and point at your head and say, go change the world right now, I'm going to kill you. You're probably still going to go change the world, right. but you're not probably not going to eat your breakfast. You're probably not going to brush your teeth. And so th there's no so there's no good or bad. It's just you you. You, you know, you can uh, increase or decrease the, the influence of the there's, so, so there's two aspects of it. There's what are you trying to do, the pr end purpose. Are you right. trying to get people to exercise more, change, help the world, or you're trying to make profit or like right. screw people right. over, right? That's the purpose of motivation. Then there's the motivation itself, and there's different sh natures of that motivation. Right. And so some people don't mind being in blackout gamification if they go to the gym more often, right? right. That's, sometimes that's what you tell trainers. You hire a trainer to just yell at you and say, stop being a loser, right? You can do it. And you're like, oh, please, no, I can't. No, you can do it. You know, get up, you know? And, and you're paying that. And, and, and again, you don't feel comfortable, but, you're pay but you want the re end result. So you don't mind black hat. So, 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 
but let, so let me ask you because you t since you touch on the gym, what does it? It seems to be such a powerful uh, framework or mindset or, or tool, you know, gamification as a whole. Um, what what are the areas of life that you think people can improve the most with gamification? And you know, how do people? How, how you know if you know I, I, someone has the octalysis? How, what do they say? How do they apply it in their lives and gamify their so lives? There, I guess. So there's four main fields of gamification that I've seen. The first one is product gamification, so making a product more interesting, exciting, getting users to come back a lot, and you know, spend money stuff like that. Second of all is marketing gamification. So, so nowadays, you know, we're consumers are building a, a, a very powerful filter. So banner ads don't really matter as much. You know, they're you know, eyeballs don't don't do the same thing anymore. So ga marketing gamification is like really about how can you create a campaign that people actually want to engage, wants to be part of. So, so think about how the power the um, the Super Bowl created commercials that are so intriguing with core drugs and unpredictable curiosity that even people who don't care about football turn their channels towards the commercials, right? Most and that doesn't make sense because most people when they see commercials they should turn their channels away from it, but they created that those commercials that people want to engage in. Um, uh, uh, Will it blend? I don't know if you've seen that on YouTube. Yep, yep. Basically. Um, you know, you're throwing iPhones into a blender to prove how powerful it is. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. So you, you engage into that, that campaign. So that's marketing gamification. Then there's workplace gamification, which is how do you get your, your employees to be more motivated, to be more excited out of work, and get them to want to wake up in the morning feeling excited. And that's usually very white hat. You know, you want, because it's long term, right? You want employees to feel great. It's not about urgency, it's about long term sustained productivity. And then there's the fourth one, which is lifestyle gamification, which deals with self improvement. And it could go to things like health, it could do from going to learning, it could go through just losing weight, whatever it is. And, um, and you know, there's a lot of new technologies that are coming out that make it more, more easy to, to, to at least track your progress, things like that, to, to, to enable the gamification. So those are the four fields that I see more often. So, so in, a, in a personal, because I'm, you know, I know a lot of people that are in you know, access sphere, they, uh, they're watching or that are part of participants or whatever, they uh, maybe, you know, the product and the... Um, uh, marketing and the the workplace that those are interesting, but where I, at least I think there's usually a lot of um, uh, potential to to improve is in how we we you know deal with our lives. It seems that a lot, it's very easy to have too many distractions in the in their daily lives, so we don't you know get to do what we wanted to do. Or it's very easy to you know get. Um, uh, attracted, you know, be attracted to things, to bad vices, you know, like food or, or uh, you know, or even video games, depending, I mean, whatever it is, that, and takes and dro uh, drive us away from the thing we would like to be doing uh, because they, you know, they will make us feel better. So in the personal um, life, what, you know, what are some areas that, you mentioned learning, you mentioned health, uh, how, like, maybe, maybe give like, some examples or ideas how, how people can gamify their learning or gamify their health. Um, yeah, and, and I'd like to start off with things that a lot of people are already familiar with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like Nike Plus, right? Nike Fuel Ban. It's right. like running is a long-term health thing, and most people feel like, hey, you know, it's, it's, our brains are really bad at, long, at figuring out long-term benefits. They like short-term gratification. So Nike Plus use, utilizes Core Drive 2 development accomplishment. It shows you, hey, look, you're improving, you're on a streak, you're doing better than last week, you're running more. It makes people feel, hey, this is good, this is nice. Let me run more, let me run more, right? That, right. That's, that's motivationally pushing you forward. Now, on the other end, there's this app called Zombies Run. And I, and I talk about these examples in my TEDx talk yep. where it pretends that you're in this apocalyptic world where zombies have taken over and you're running with headphones on and there's a plot the radio stations talking to you saying, hey, look, you're, there are zombies from the south, from the, from the east, and they're closing on. you got to run faster, right? And so you're running because you want to avoid being eaten by zombies. Um, then there are things like uh, learning, different learning apps. So there's this, this one I didn't mention. So in my TEDx, I mentioned a Dragon Box, which is a, which is a learning game that gets kids addicted to solving a bunch of algebra questions. And, uh, and it's, it's crazy because... Because you know, I you know, I was okay at math, but I really hated it. I thought it was boring and dull, and I didn't see the point. Like after two hours, x equals four. So what? Like who cares that x equals four? But 
But Dragon Box, they said, oh, well, you're, you're solving this problem because you're trying to grow your dragon. As, you know, because dragon hates, like, irrational numbers. And dragons <laughs> hate, like, when, like, equations are left there. So you have to clean this room for, clean this space for the dragon so it comes out and eat and, and, and grows. So, so now the little kids, they don't even know it's math. They just think, oh, okay, I'm going to solve this puzzle so my dragon can, can, can eat, right? And it's, and it's amazing. Like, I have second grade chess students who, who are playing this, like, crazy and it's been like 80 levels and I'm looking at these problems like and, and um and I'm looking at these problems I'm like I'm not even sure I can solve them myself reason I have to right. think about it and it's like I kind of forgot and again I'm I, you know these second kids second graders are like no this is easy right <laughs> blah, blah, blah. so so that's amazing there's another one that I thought was really cool uh, something called code spells and this is about learning how to how to how to do programming uh, and this is designed for kids, but basically it pretends that you're in wizard school. You're, you're a wizard. And your scroll is your code. So if your spell doesn't work, it's because there's a bug in your scroll. Oh, and you man. have to fix it. So it's like fire equals off. You have to change it to fire equals on. And now I can do the fire spell. And yeah, then if yeah. you want to learn how to increase your spell's capability by going from damaging one thing to like a group, a mass target... Then you have to go in your code again and change change your scroll. So now you're. I know a lot, I know a lot of grown ups that would love to use that one. By the way. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so again that that is four drive three right empowerment of creativity and feedback it allows you to problem solve you see feedback ah oh, fire now great and and it builds and it builds your character there's ownership of possession and if you can do it with friends there's social influence related so there's a lot of these type of stuff one of the things that um that I've actually seen a lot of like, some quick things. Uh, that that drive results is turning your rewards into into dice throws. So if you get some get some dice and say, hey, look, if I am if I am trying to uh, make sure I don't eat as much unhealthy food, then get two get two dice and uh, so say like one you know assign some type of food for all these numbers, yep. and the unhealthy food is like twelve, which is twelve and two are the hardest to get because you have to have right. one one. Or six six like it's it's most people think oh they they all have the same percentages no that's not the case because right. there's a, there's tons of ways to get to a six but only one way to get to a twelve right. so just that twelve is eating a burger right and you figure out what to eat you throw a dice and you're like oh okay it's five I'm gonna <laughs> eat a salad oh it's seven. and you you you, wow. you 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 pick in the design where you're not eating hamburgers as much but it is but it's it's a reward there right it's like right. yes I got a twelve and right. you eat it and you right. feel good about it. So, so you can build that into a reward. So every time I finish my task, I can throw a dice, right? And, 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 and you know, maybe the, again, two or 12 might be things that are just like, oh, I buy like a $50 thing for myself. Like I treat myself out. Right. And then everything else is, and, and, and sometimes it's more fun if there's like trap clauses. Like if I roll a four, oh, that means I have to do 100 push-ups. That sucks. <laughs> you know? So, so you, you, you finish a lot of work and you're like, I want a reward. And it's like, right. oh, push-up, man. So for that... <laughs> That feeling of maybe I'll get something great, but there's a small chance I'll get screwed is actually very engaging. So, right? and, and so it seems, I mean, and uh, and I mean, to me, it's fascinating. Like, I, I, it's fascinating because I'm someone that is very interested in, uh, in you know, system implementation in my life. So it's just, I, I want because I know that I can't. No way, you know, I'm a, everyone makes fun of me because I make lists for everything and. And because I, if I don't do it, I know I'm going to forget things. So I need systems around me. And this is sort of like, uh, you know, and of course it's an important system for, for business. But, but like I said, I think what I want to sort of shed some light at is that for the individual, for, for, for personal growth, this is also a very important uh, concept to grasp. And, and maybe to, um, to wrap it up, Yuka, I'm thinking, what, if you have to tell someone, you know, uh, okay, you want to have this, you want to accomplish this particular thing in your personal life. You know, you want to maybe, uh, like we said, you know, grow, uh, uh, run faster, whatever, like, um, you know, get healthier, learn more, learn another language, whatever it is. How would they look at, you know, is how, walk, walk us through using the octalysis for a second, like simulation of how do I use the octalysis for whatever it is that I want to accomplish? How do I look at it and... How do I maybe play with it or play with the ideas so I can um, start experimenting in ways in a, to accomplish something? And, and you're talking about specifically about self improvement, lifestyle gamification. I think in this case, I'm more interested in that. Yes, absolutely. 
Okay. And, and keep in mind, either way, there's a lot of ways to do it, depending on what level you're doing and whatnot. But the quick and easy way to do it is define a, first of all, design, define your metrics. So what, what quantitative numbers do you want to improve? It could be weight, it could be tasks done a day, all that's any, anyhow, it just needs to be measurable. Two is figure out the desired actions. What are the actions you want yourself to do? So once you have desired actions laid out, eating more, blah, 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 like, or eating more, eating, eating more healthy foods, uh, exercising more, whatnot, then you start applying octalysis, right? Think, think through the eight core drive. Can, how can I, you know, how can I add more epic meaning and calling into this task? How can I add more development accomplishment? How can I add more uh, empowerment, creative and feedback? And so once you think through these eight core drives for each task you need to do, you can start designing things that will motivate you more. Because again, if there's none of those eight there, there's no motivation at all. Like people drop out, they just stop. And, and, and also one thing that I haven't talked a lot about is there's also anti-core drives, you know, and anti-core drives are those core drives that motivate you against what you want to do, mm. right? So loss and avoidance is sometimes a big, a big anti-core drive. So one of the thing, one of the things in loss avoidance is what I call status quo sloth, which is you're lazy. You just don't want to change your behavior. Right, and so you're unmotivated by loss and avoidance. Right. That's your anti-core drive. So you need to figure out how to either push out the other core drives more, or try, try to avoid that. So people, it's interesting because when people are not motivated because of core slot, the way to get them to work is also loss and avoidance. Like, oh, I procrastinate so much, And and so and this, so that's why when they get out their butts and do it. But again, this whole thing is black hat, so they feel bad inside. So so you want to think through the eight core drives and apply them to all the activity. When I say throw a dice to determine, you know, what's your reward or for productivity, I'm just saying, hey, add core drive seven. I'm predicting curiosity to it. But you can add other things to it. You can add more social influence. People say, hey, if you have a goal. Let your friends know, like publish your to-do list and all your right. friends will see how much work you've done today, right? right? That's social influence. That's like, oh crap, I don't want people to think I'm a loser. Right. So, so, so there's a lot of things. It's, it's, one of the things that's really hard to do though is add core drive six to yourself, scarcity and impatience. Because, you know, it, it, it's hard to say, right. I just cannot have it because you have the power to give it to yourself, but you, right. you know, it requires more discipline. You kind of have to need someone else say, I put this in your hands. You can control when I right. when I do this, when I don't. Right. Right. But what, you know what's interesting, and and I, uh, sort of to to wrap this up is that you're talking about I, what I want people to get from what you're saying is that don't just look at the you know the sort of concepts on this framework and think about it. You have to actually <clears throat> you use the word design. You have to actually design systems and put that sort of you know front load the work of creating a system which maybe is just getting a couple of dices but you have to go and get the dices uh, and to then make your life easier for the rest of the, the process but <clears throat> systems require a bit Scar of a, scarcity and patience there you go <laughs> means the lack of time and you gotta gotta do things quickly exactly you ha exactly so it is take the work to take, the, uh, take some time to and put the work to design those systems and then <clears throat> The, you know, you let the, the motivations, the drives uh, do its do its work, uh, so you can actually accomplish the goals. Reminds me of a uh, I'll finish with one example. Uh, Dan Ariely, this behavioral psychologist, uh, behavioral econo economist from uh, he teaches in Duke. Uh, he was talking about reward substitution and how he, when he was, uh, you know, he had some disease and he had to take this really nasty shots every day that would make him vomit and whatever for like a year. It was awful. Uh, but the, but he said, well, I love movies. So what I'm going to do is uh, every time I you know I take the shot, I earn watching a movie. So he would like get all these you know hundreds of movies to watch uh, already you know uh, uh, set up, and then he just get the shot and I immediately get his reward. But he did had to do the work of okay, I'm going to bring all these movies here so I can watch them once I sick because he needed to do that that you know little trick in his mind. He needed that system so because if he if he relied only on willpower, he knew he was going to fail. Yeah, so this, this, this is, again, the difference between human-focused design and function-focused design. Right, right. If you just think, well, I need to do all this stuff. I need to put a list together. I need to tell me. And you assume you will do the work. You right. forget right. that you as a human being have motivations, have insecurities, have reasons why you do not do, want to do something. So you actually have to design for your own motivation. You can't just assume you will do something yourself.
Right. Yes, I, I I agree, and that's that's a perfect uh, finish point. We're very fragile. We need some help, and uh, and uh, gamification is a great way to do it. Um, you guys, uh, thank you a lot, man, for uh, for your talk, for giving us some time. Uh, very enlightening, and uh, I will share a lot of the stuff you're doing with Clip Sharing because it's fantastic. Sounds great. Thank you so uh, much. Take care, man. We'll talk soon. Thank you.